Bu oturumumuzda sözü moderatörümüz Kanike Valya'ya veriyorum. Buyurun hocam. Çok teşekkür ederim. Uh, good evening everybody. Uh, once again I welcome you all uh, in fifth Sine Philosophers uh, Symposium. I'm Kanika Valya. Uh, I will be the moderator for this session. Uh, the theme for this session is crystal, baric, uh, surreal image and absurdity. Uh, we have three panelists with us uh, to discuss on this theme. So our first panelist uh, will be joining uh, us online uh, via Zoom. So his name is Ori Yagovic. A little of uh, a short introduction I will give about him. Um, Ori Yagovic is a filmmaker uh, well known for his work like The Last Strawberry. He is associated with the prestige film uh, school, Steve Tisch School of Film and and uh, television of Tel Aviv University. He has pursued his degree in filmmaking from the same university. Sorry for my pronunciation. Uh, Ori, sir, can you hear me? Welcome. Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. So you can start with your words. Okay, so I'll share the presentation. In a second. Can you see my uh, presentation? Yes, okay, everybody. So, uh, a good afternoon to everybody. Um, my presentation will be about the cinematic space and the absurd. Um, cinema and philosophy have many different intersections between them. But while many movies claim to be philosophical, or claim to present relevant philosophical ideas and discussions, an important question still stands. Can cinema do philosophy? Um, if so, how is it different than the traditional way of philosophizing? In this paper, I will argue that cinema can indeed contribute to the discourse of philosophy through the utilization of its unique ability to create a cinematic space, meaning using film language and narrative that can simulate philosophical ideas and arguments for the viewers. I will demonstrate this specifically through an examination of, an, an, of the existence, um, existential themes of the absurd in two recent American films. A Serious Man by the Corn Brothers from 2009 and I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Charlie Kaufman from 2020. In his famous essay, La Camera Stylo, or The Camera Pen from 1948, Alexander Struck radically argues that cinema has the potential to replace the written word as the main tool for expressing philosophical ideas. He argues the cart of today would have already have shut himself up in his bedroom with a 16mm camera and some film and would be writing, writing, would be writing his philosophy on film. For, the, for his discourse de la Motote, would today be of such a kind that only the cinema could ex express it satisfactorily. There will be several cinemas, just as today there are several literatures, for cinema, like literature, is not so much a particular art as a language which can express any sphere of thought. Today, 84 years later, a strict vision of the many cinemas definitely manifested itself. But can the cinematic language ever replace the written language as the most useful tool for expressing philosophical ideas? After all, even we, cinematic scholars, publish our thesis and articles using the written language and present them in conferences like this one using the spoken language. So, where are the intersections of cinema in phil and philosophy? Okay. Uh, okay. So, where are the intersections of cinema and philosophy? In what is cinema from philosophy of film and motion picture? North Carroll defines cinema as the detached display of movement that generate tokens of meaning. The possibilities of meaning in cinema depends on its usage of its cinematic tools. 
cinemat cinematography, mise en scène, editing, sound, etc. When used wisely, combining these tools has the ability to communicate endless arrays of narratives to viewers around the world. These narratives can have their added values, but their primary goal is to engage and entertain the audience, at least when we discuss commercial cinema. On the other corner, we have philosophy. Thomas Waterberg defines philosophy as the search after general truths using explicit arguments. While cinema aspires to engage, philosophy aspires to expand our knowledge about the general truths of the world. Although these two seem as different as two fields of expression can be, this is not the case. First of all, narrative is an indispensable part of philosophy. The usage of narrative in philosophy is as old as philosophy itself. Since the days of Plato and his cave, all the way to Sartre and Camus and their novels and plays, narrative has been a reliable search strategy in order to communicate abstract ideas of general truths. Cinema, or should I say cinemas, is currently the medium with the widest outreach of narratives around the globe. This means that theoretically, cinema can present philosophical ideas to the biggest array of people out of all the different artistic media platforms. Despite this, narrative is definitely not exclusive to cinema, which leaves us with the question of what is cinema unique and specific contribution to philosophy? While narratives exist in many different artistic media platforms, Cinema has many different specific cinematic use, use, tools in its arsenal. Cinematography, mise-en-scene, editing, etc. These tools are not just tools to tell a story, but first and first and foremost, they are illustrative tools with the power to create visual cinematic space that means mimics or creates a new reality for the engaged viewers. Waterberg explored these unique traits of cinema as an illustrative tool in relation to philosophical discourse. Waterbergs compared this relationship to the role of birds illustrations in a bird manual. He writes, illustrations are integral to the book's purpose, for they convey a great deal of information that is not acceptable for text alone. It is a mistake to conclude that just because the film illustrates the view of a philosopher, that it's not itself philosophy in action. That is, a genuine instance of philosophy on, in, or through film. Cinematic tools can illustrate abstract, emotional, and even philosophical charge experience, visions, and even entire worlds. To demonstrate the poss possibility of philosophy through film, I will examine the ways in which ex existentialism and the notion of the absurd manifest itself in contemporary cinema. First of all, what is existentialism? Existentialism, in a nutshell, is the idea that a person or a subject's essence and meaning, starting point, is not an a priori one, but a phenomenological one, derived from the sub subjective experience of life itself. In the words of the existential philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, what do we mean by saying that existence precedes its essence? We mean that the man, first of all, exists, encounters himself, surges up in the world, and defines himself afterwards. According to Sartre, and his existential peers, like Albert Camus. It is the role of the subject to give meaning to his life. In order to live truly authentic lives, there is a need to acknowledge the state of chaotic absurd of the world, or the lack of pre-existing objective meaning. A sense of purpose and meaning is something we all crave and need in our life. Once the subject acknowledges that his subjective phenomenological experience is the starting point of meaning, and not the absurd world, that lack, that lack any inherent meaning, he can make himself into a fulfilled individual. Sartre and Camus demonstrated their philosophy not only through written message, but also through fiction, novels, plays, and even movie scripts. From Camus to The Stranger to Sartre and Nausea, existentialism rhetoric was always intertwined with narrative-based modes of expression. All of these works of fiction were based on a narrative of absurdity, or in other words, seeking of, uh, seeking of answers in an answerless world. And in the, uh, and in an absurd answerless world, any meaning your life has been given to it is, was given by you. But how can existentialism be demonstrated through cinematic uh, tools? In order to demonstrate this, I will first analyze the Coen Brothers' A Serious Man. The film tells the story of Larry Gopnik, played by Michael Stalberg 
a Jewish physics professor in the 60s suburbia in America. His life is being torn apart. His wife is living him. A student blames blackmails him for a better grade. His jobless brother moves into his place, and someone is trying to sabotage his tenure status at the university. Larry seeks advice from three different rabbis, but he fails to find any helpful life advice from any of them, and decides to, to try to better his conditions and find meaning in his, in his chaotic life, but miserably fails. Existential ideas are found throughout the entire film, but are most prominent in two sequences. The ending and the Goistis sequence. The Goistis sequence appears when Larry visits the second rabbi and desperately asks, What does Hashem, or God, is trying to tell him to do with all the signs he sees in his life? The rabbi tries to confort, confront Larry by telling him a tale that we see as a short story inside the overarching narrative of the film. The tale is about the Jewish dentist that finds the word, the word Oshiem the Hebrew for save me, inside the Goy's mouth. This revelation destroys his life as he becomes obsessed with finding the meaning of, the, of these signs from God. As he comes for the rabbi for advice, the rabbi tells him he can't ever really know what these signs means, and he should just focus on being a good person. This, the approval on, on a stop seeking meaning in the absurd world, world comes the dentist and he returns to his previously content life. This short six minute sequence demonstrates the fulfillment that can be accomplished by accepting the absurd, the answerless world. But obviously, me telling you the story of this sequence could never replace watching it. In this sense, the visuals of cinema tell narratives in an essentially different way than verbal or written language. The cinematic language does not only demonstrate a narrative that supports accepting the absurd but it also creates a new cinematic space that illustrates the same absurd in a manner that does not only resonate with people intellectually, but also emotionally. The usage of actors, realistic sets, and the clever usage of sound and visual helps the viewers to identify themselves with the same ex existential angst, the picture sorry, characters... Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. You are so fast. Please, can you speak slowly? Little bit slowly. Yes, Because it's slowly. getting translated, so of it's... Of course. So no sorry. Problem, Tanika. I'll speak slower. Okay. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. And no problem. The usage of actors, realistic sets, and the clever usage of sound and visuals helps the viewers to identify themselves with the same existential angst the fictional character lived through and apply it to his or own or her own life. The film demonstrates the emotional consequences of not accepting the absurds in a visual cautionary tale. By making the viewers fully identify with the characters that live in a crisis of meaning, he can teach them a valuable and personal applicable message about the search for subjective meaning. The ending of the film consists of, of Larry deciding to, cha to change the scores of his student and accept his bribe, while Larry's son is deciding to give his bully slash weed dealer the money he owes him. As this happened, Larry receives a call from his doctor that he might have a serious health-related issue, while a hurricane is about to hit Larry's son's school. While the hurricane comes close to his school, he and his bully watch it come, coming by and forget all about the money dispute. The open ending visually illustrates the individuals facing the meaningless world, full with death by disease and forces of nature. All of the moral answers men acquired for themselves don't mean anything in the end with, fa with facing the same absurd. The cinematic forces of the, of the tornado demonstrate better than any written text the experience of facing a careless world. While the open ending forces the viewer to, for to form his own meaning into the cinematic space in a true notion of individual phenomenological action of formalizing meaning. Only the individual viewer can decide if the actions of the characters were moral, meaningful, or just, according to his or own sets of ideals and interpretations. But, if the viewer needs to rely on... Second. If the viewer needs to rely on an extra cinematic discussion and written philosophical text in order to reach an, an existential conclusion, 
Did the film really perform a philosophical act? In his essay, Film as Philosophy, Aaron Smuts argues that the fact that the philosophical ideas that appear in the films can be translated into written language does not deny the fact that it is the film that articulated those arguments. Film cannot create a philosophical discussion without any interaction with the spoken language, but despite the reliance on spoken or written language by the viewers to interpret the film, it is the film that provided those ideas and fertile ground for philosophical conclusions to grow. In this sense, existentialism is the per perfect philosophy to be demonstrated through film because it requires the engagement by the viewers. Sorry to interrupt to again, Ori. Uh, yes. Last two minutes left. No problem. Because it requires the engagement by the viewers in order to create a meaning out of the cinematic text. In this, in this sense, as the movie's meaning depends more on subjective reading of it and not the objective truth, it demonstrates the values of existing, existent, existential creation of meaning more, than, more in a phenomenological sense. This connection between philosophical ideas in, in a film to the process of formalizing meaning has a higher value as the movie's contents become more ambivalent and deprive the viewer from an absolute meaning. Movies like I'm thinking of ending things. A surreal film about a woman trying to make a sense of her identity while in a meeting with her parents, partner's parents, forced the viewer to look at the meaningless in the in this objective uh, look at the meaningless in the objective sense cinematic world, where only as a viewer can create his own individual and subjective meaning. Vivian subjects argues. More than any other medium of human communication, the moving picture makes itself sensibly manifest as the expression of experience by experience. But what if a film creates an experience that is logically and emotionally unrealistic and chaotic? I'm thinking of ending things, recreate for the viewer the experience of the absurd in its most explicit sense. It does not attempt to create a realistic experience, but an abstract one that requires the, active, the viewer active participation for creation of meaning. As the viewer desperately try to create meaning in the absurd cinematic space, he learns a valuable existential lesson about the process in which he alone is, a, is the source of meaning in his world. In summary, film can be a useful tool for a philo for philosophy. It can make countless philosophical ideas and narratives consumable for the mass public around the world. It can illustrate certain ideas better than any written text, and it can create a new, new experiences and spaces that can be used as tools for people to create meaning out of their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for your nice words. Uh, it, it, uh, you said too much about cinematic space uh, and uh, abs absurd. Thank you so much. And now uh, uh, we are going to the second panelist. Uh, our, for to, uh, today, our second panelist is Christopher Escobar. Uh, short introduction I will give, give about him. Uh, Dr. Professor Escobar is a teaching associate at the University of Melbourne and a coordinator of the Screening Idea Program. His research interest centers on film philosophy, modernism, and Latin American cinemas. Uh, he is the author of in uh, the Intensive Image in Deleuze Film Philosophy and has published in various international journals on film theories. Uh, welcome, Professor. Please, Thank you, so much. you can start. Can you hear me well? Yeah, good evening, yeah. Hojam. Good, good evening, evening good sir. Morning. South of Chile, I'm joining you from uh, the Araucania region. Uh, I, would, I wish to be there in Ankara with all of you, but for family reasons, I had to stay. Uh, thanks to Cine Philosophy Editorial Board for this kind invitation, and, for, and to Ori for his uh, amazing presentation on the absurd and cinematic space. So I'll be talking about uh, Lucrecia Martel's Sama, an Argentinian film, and her process of de-visualization how to make things that are visible kind of invisible. From the novel written by uh, Antonio Di Benedetto to uh, her film, right? So very aligned with uh, Ori's preoccupations as well. 
All right, so before I begin, I would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land on which I was born and from which I, I am joining you this evening, the Mapuche people from uh, the Walmapu Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, Loncos and, 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 and Machi elders. And as a matter of fact, uh, this acknowledgement to the indigenous uh, elders of South America, South America will be integral to my analysis of Lucretia Martel's Sama and her transposition uh, from Antonio de Benedetto's book of uh, the same name written in 1956. Sorry. Uh, and this is because the film, uh, I believe, is able to politicize the colonial past in which the novel is rooted by giving primacy to the aboriginal subjectivity which is rather absent or at best marginal in the written work in the novel. Right? So, for those who have watched the film, um, you will remember that at, at the start of the story we see Don Diego de Sama our magistrate of Indians standing upright at the center of the frame, right, in the river bank, while in the background of the image there is a group of indigenous children uttering unintelligible words in local dialect. And by the end of the story, and, 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 and I'm very sorry for exploring the films for those who haven't watched it yet, which is a great film to see, by the way, we see again Don Diego de Sana in the creek, but this time lying like a restless cadaver uh, on top of a canoe pulled by the indigenous, right? So the film basically begins and ends with an image of the indigenous. Uh, and these passages, however, never appear in the novel. Instead, Di Benedetto begins his book with an image of Sama looking at a monkey in the port, uh, and at the end, uh, and it ends with our protagonist reaffirming his own European standing by looking at a blonde boy in the creek, and who in a way crystallizes uh, the ideal image of Sama as a Spanish team, right? He says in the book, he, it wasn't an Indian, it, it, was, it was the blonde boy. He was me, myself uh, before me. So one of the ideas that I want to convey today is that by deepening Sama's uh, relationship to his locality uh, in the Visa Royalty of the Rio de la Plata, currently Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay, uh, instead of reaffirming his own Euro European heritage, uh, as the book does next to this image of the blonde kid uh, appearing to him at the end of the story, Martel instead complicates the question of Latin American identity by giving primacy to those voices of the subaltern that are not, are not existent in the novel, right? So, politicizing the colonial past in which the novel is established means, um, above all, to denaturalize the hierarchies organizing local history by virtue of a male character who grants us access to those minor voices populating all corners of the screen, yet not the literary piece, that's the main point. And by the same token, and more broadly, I argue that Martel's film is able to push the Benedetto's literary images towards higher levels of cinematic abstraction. And this is done by means of a process that I call the visualization, a process that renders more ambiguous the standing of our literary protagonists by maintaining that Sama's mental confusion and bodily collapse, which is something initially problematizing the book, uh, is further obscured in the film under issues of both uh, personal and cultural identity, as well as under a feminist um, contamination of the novel. And this process has to do uh, in general with Martel's politics of a script adaptation, a mode of transposition that she calls contamination, uh, which is the term that the ancient uh, Romans employed to incor incorporate and transform previous Greek materials into their own cultural text, and which Martel uses here in a way as her method to polit politically rearrange 
the novel, right? Um, and so, <clears throat> in order to develop this idea, I suggest that there are at least three operations the filmmaker employs to contaminate or reimagine the novel. The first one has already been noted, which is her intention to reverse the 18th century's colonial period in which the book takes place by creating a character who makes us see, hear, and feel about a world that is lost in the past, but that centuries later is keep resonating next to our contemporary relations of race, class, as, and gender, right? Uh, the other two operations that I'm investigating in this paper, which I hope to publish soon, uh, fall under a more subtractive technique that I would define following Jacques Rancière as the method of uh, devisualization. In the case of Martel, this is done by means of a haptic screenplay that favors rhythmic editing over the notative meanings based on images that are felt and flowing rather than blocked or captured by the pool of narrative meaning. And this is essentially a move that accentuates the tactility and indirectness already contained in the book by creating a structure that wants to be another structure, as Pasolini refers to his own book to screen adaptations, and that Ori was also kind of investigating in his paper about the relationship between film and philosophy, the written work and the audio audiovisual work. And so in the case of Sama, this devisualizing method has to do with transforming the novel's first person narrator into an almost speechless character throughout her film, so that by cutting out most, most of the storyline from his lips, Sama's interior monologues are transposed uh, into more diffuse external dialogues, allowing the filmmaker to convert the center of literary action in the novel into more sensuous episodes on the screen. And next to this, uh, is, there is another subtraction that I would associate to Martel's digitalizing technique, which is her decision to erase the temporal breaks proposed by the novel so as to dehistoricize its chronology, as well as to complicate the viewer's capacity for orientation on a screen. And this sort of transposition uh, from book, book to screen creates another mode of temporality that no longer responds to chronological orderings, but to a cyclical pattern, right? Which is a kind of metamorphic temporality that displaces the visual immediacy of what we see on a screen uh, for the invisible content of a feeling. And so, the main idea, therefore, can be echoed by Raoul Ries uh, when he asked in his diario, in his diary, whether or not cinema as an art form can be placed at the antipodes of literature, in the sense that literature is the art which grants visibility to the blind person. You don't need your eyes to see the images present, presented to you as a reader in the, in the written piece. Uh, where cinema is the art which plants the cedar by making um, invisible through material and visual uh, means those uh, images on the screen. In other words, the question that I'm posing here is the following. How can cinema respond to and, as it were, overturn this form of vis visuality that precedes it in the novel? And here, I follow Jacques Rancière's Le Descartes du Cinéma and his chapter on Mouchette and the Paradox of Language of Images, when he claims that cinema arises not against theater but after literature, though not in the sense of saying that what cinema does is to translate written stories into audiovisual pieces, but that in the very corpus of the novel, you already find a form of visuality that is properly cinematic. Literature, he says, is not simply the art of language that would need to be put into plastic images and cinematic movement. It is a practice of, of language that also carries a particular idea of imaginings or of mobility, right? End of quote. So how can cinema transform this form of visuality 
originate, originated in the literary work. According to Jacques Rancière, this is a process that withdraws from the excess of imagiété contained in the book for a more haptic montage that devisualizes its narrative content on a screen. And this is a visitation to the world of literature that pushes its images, and I quote, towards higher levels of cinematic abstraction. So, such literary cinematographism is exemplified by Rancière next to George Bernanos' book, Nouvelle Histoire de Mouchet, under what he calls the sequ sequentialized tempo of the novel. And, and this is a sequencing that is then de schematized by Robert Bresson's Bill Mouchet from 1967. And according to Rancière, what Bresson does uh, to the literary piece is to fragment its tempo and motion into a language that would, in a way, remove uh, those concrete sensations of the story for a space that is connected sensuously via three subtracting techniques. Those are that of Bresson's intuitive hand or feeling image, as Gilles Deleuze calls it, that of the film's mise-en-scene and its haunting screenplay, and that of the role of the actress in Mouchette, Nadine Nord Nordier, whose performance is described by the philosopher not as one of the most astonishing in the history of cinema, but also one that displays a theatrical talent for opacity. And so these three elements combined, Rancière concludes, make up the quintessential or paradoxical as well language of cinema. I quote, the language of images is thus not a pure language. It is a compromise between divergent poetics, a complex interlacing of the functions of visual presentation, oral expression, and narrative sequencing. What comes after literature is not the art of the language of pure images, nor is it a return to the old re representational order. Rather, it is a double excess which pulls the literary doctrine backwards on one side and ahead of itself on the other. It is what I have suggested elsewhere. Sorry, to interrupt, to, sorry to interrupt you, Professor. It's two minutes yeah. left. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll try to get at the end. Um, and so, in the light of Rancière's logic, to say that cinema arises after literature is that's only partially correct, because it is also from theater, the oral expression of the actress, and painting the visual presentation of the story that his reading of Mouchette interlaces and mixtures of divergent poetics. And as a side note, that's, that's why, why Alain Badiou, for instance, called the cinema the art of taking, because what, what cinema is, is taken from the previous art, right? It's a kind of theory activity. Um, but let's move on for the sake of uh, time. Uh, by the same token, what I've been trying to suggest here is that Martel devisualizes the Benedetto Sama by pushing his literary images toward higher levels of poetic and political sensibility. And, and the first and most general subtraction, a process of contamination, according to Martel, or devisualization, according to Rancière, would thus have to deal with the politics of adaptation itself. Right? Uh, so, as Martel explains in this uh, interview, uh, to authentically screenplay a novel, you don't need to be faithful to the narrator's voice in the text, but on the contrary, as she does in Sama, which is her first literary adaptation, by the way, you need to infect the book's images by following your own intuitive thoughts as a reader. And this is the reason why adaptation for her represents a form of paradoxy, uh, or in words of Robert Stamp, a plethora of possible meanings or readings produced by an ever-shifting grid of interpretation. So what she says here is that a novel is cinematic when its language permits you to create your own, when its drama, its words lend themselves to the creation of a new audiovisual language, right? And this is basically the idea of the ancient Romans, uh, uh, in which they reworked ancient Greek 
literature incorporating the same basic elements into their own cultural setting, which was very different. And so this is probably what Martel calls contamination or contamination to translate the written work into an audiovisual piece. All right, so for the sake of time, I'll just leave it there, uh, waiting to have some time for discussion at the end. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, the email is there in case you want to get in touch and continue this correspondence. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, your words were so kind. And you talk about the JAMA and the process of de-visualization uh, and the language of images. So thank you so much, Professor. Thanks again, Kanika, uh, for your kindness. You're welcome, Professor. Uh, so our third panelist for uh, this session will be Lloyd. Dior. Palestine. Pelestein, sorry for my pronunciation. Uh, Lear is a MA student in Tel Aviv University. Yeah, he has bachelor's degree in film, cinema, and video studies. He is filmmaker and researcher based in Tel Aviv University. Lear, you can continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kanika. And thank you, Christopher. And thank you, Ori, a good friend from back home. Um, so my talk here today will be called Return to Twin Peaks Through the Crystal. Uh, but first, I would like to express my appreciation for being here. I hope that my presence here will contribute to the relationship between our countries, pulling us out from our dead ends, or our points of the Aporia, and seeing inside the points of the Aporia in Twin Peaks, The Return, directed by David Lynch and Mark Frost from 2017, will be my main focus here today. Does it work? Sorry. So I'll just continue on. My main inquiry is we will examine how the return produces, uh, Twin Peaks the return produces the experience of the upper year as a state of, non of the non passage and the ways the points of the upper year disrupt and utilize the return to function according to them when complicating the serious relationship with Twin Peaks, directed by Lynch and Frost from 1991, and Twin Peaks, Firewalk With Me, directed by Lynch in 92. Next slide. My main claim will show that the points of the upper year in the return complicate the temporal experience of the Twin Peaks universe, offering the establishment of crystal images, which informs both versions of the past and future at the same time. Next slide. First, I'll consider the return as a late version and a hypotext to Twin Peaks, its hypotext, and Firewalk with me using Gerard Jeanette's 82 palimpsests. Then, following Jim Deleuze's difference in repetition from 68, I'll see the return as a disguised variation, replying, sorry, relying on repetition to establish differences from the early versions. After all, I'm dealing with the returns time and Laura Palmer, who is the main protagonist, uh, right. um, played by Sherry Lee, being dead and alive at the points of the Aporier, which Jacques Derrida, in his 93 Fini, saw as a threshold experience. Following the Aporier, I tried to think of the return as a unique case that tangles both hippo and hypertext inciting incidents together. The discovery of Laura Palmer's corpse from Twin, Twin Peaks, and Dan Cooper, who is played by Karl McLachlan, saving her in the return. Trying to see inside the serious points of the Aporier will lead me to the entanglement of past and present events, establishing Twin Peaks as an, an ontology to the return, a concept offered by Derrida in the Spectres of Marx from 93, which refers to the active haunting of the present by the heterogeneous past, offering simultaneous existence for both. Following it, I consider the return as a manifestation of crystal images operating in a crystal time, which Deleuze, in his 85 Cinema 2, the time image, sought to entail both versions of the past and future at, at once. Please move on. The return is higher. There cannot be the return without Twin Peaks. 
There's no hypertext without a hypertext. For Jeanette, the two are any relationship united in a text, a hypertext, which is not an autonomous act, but is contingent on its earlier text, a hypertext, which it, which it is transforming as correction of an unfinished work. With Jeanette, the return, the return can be considered, considered as a late version of Twin Peaks and not its sequel, not only because it came after and derived from, an, from artistic needs to correct its errors, but also because the concept of sequel has been rooted in direct and formalic continuity as Martha Notchimson, Martha Notchimson shows in her book, The Author Series from 2019. The return does not chronologically proceed to Twin Peaks and does not have a linear time structure. It disrupts its time of events and narrative logic while preserving elements from the early versions to develop variations. This variation occurs by disrupting what Notchimson calls in her book, the perfect hero formula, which reduces everything for the hero's progress towards closure. In Twin Peaks, the perfect hero Cooper solves the mystery who killed Laura Palmer. In the first episode of The Return, he meets Palmer in the waiting room, which is a parallel space from the ever, preserved from the early version, versions, where laws, of physics, and, laws of, of physics and time are defined. She tells him there about being both dead and alive, creating a sense of urgency to find her. The meeting marks a promise, a contract, bet between Palmer as a missing object, Cooper as the explorer, and the viewers as the, journey com the journey's companions. But the return haunts Cooper and the investigation, playing with anticipation and diverting the yellow brick road. They finally meet in, in episode 17, but the mystery is only magnified and left unresolved in the series finale cliffhanger. The return, unfulfilled promise, stimulates an, expectation, stimulates an expectation of arrival of things to come, creating a frustrating view, viewing experience of standing on an embarrassing edge, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Next slide. Through its different points of focus, themes, and stylistic otherness, the return acts, acts as a disguised version of Twin Peaks and not its sequel, preserving the imminent element which ignited the universe, a great mystery. It's a disguise because although the return arrived after Twin Peaks, it does not extend its narrative, but generates a change. Its main goal is not to go back to Twin Peaks to update our knowledge about the characters, but to explore hidden elements and develop other possibilities. In this manner, the return, the return does repetition in the Delusian sense. It develops hidden forces from the early versions as the will to unveil a great mystery and manifests them through the disguised images in the late one, creating a dynamic movement between the versions and constituting variations that emerge from the same essence. Indifference and repetition, the lose seed in the disguised variation as a difference created from the act of repetition. The variations express, and I quote from page 17, the differential mechanisms which belong to the essence and origin of that which is repeated, end of quote. Such repetition, which creates difference, differences emerging from the same essence, can be seen from the ontological possibilities given to the giant, which is a character from Twin Peaks, played by Karl Struiken, who is transformed into the fireman in the return. Can you please move on to that? Yep. Um, in Twin Peaks, the giant was only related to Cooper's dreams. He did not possess uh, another one. Yeah, this one. Thanks. Um, sorry. In Twin Peaks, the giant was only related to Cooper's dreams. He did not possess a direct influence on the series, like Jesus, but only from a second degree, guiding Cooper and the viewers towards a cathartic closure, solving Laura's mystery. In the return, the fireman is placed in the White Lodge, a new alternative space that was only alluded to in Twin Peaks. His, re his rhythmic form of expression is repeated, but is disconnected from Cooper making him an independent agent who can intervene in the diegesis, his action, in the Returns episode eight, after the atomic bomb sequence, atomic bomb sequence led to the birth of the Black Lodge, subverts the sequence and the overall possibilities given to, char to characters in the early versions. He inserts more of Palmer's golden seed, which you can see right here. No, no, which, go back, just this big seed which uh, goes in for the White Lodge, silver screen into Twin Peaks as a symbolic warrant 
and an action which moves the boundaries between the diegesis and non-diegesis, tangling both categories together. Through the, the, the disguise, this essence of mystery is repeated, as well as the reflexive allegory of Nietzsche's an all-encompassing creator. The difference lies in his independent existence. Let's move on to the next. Now let's move to the Aporiers. Mike, played by Anna Strobel, who recently passed away, unfortunately, is a, vari a, va is a variation of the armless man from Twin Peaks, asks Cooper in the waiting room, is it future or is it past? In the same sequence, Nora tells Dale, I am dead yet I live, two points of the upper year. Another one is manifested in the last scene of episode 18, where Cooper asks Nora, what year is this? Leaving the series on a cliffhanger, following, following Aristotle's physics, Derrida saw the experience of the upper year as a non-passage stage, which derives from the experience of not knowing where to go and what paralyzes us in it. I quote from Fini, page 12, what appears to block our way in the very place where it would no longer be possible to constitute a problem, a project, or a projection, end of quote. To see inside the points of the upper year, I'll start with Mike's question, then create a detour to Cooper's trying to offer, to Cooper's trying to offer a possibility of power being both dead and alive. For Martin Heidegger's 1927 being and time, Temporality is the essential way in which being conceives from the present time of the past and future of horizon, horizons, thus allowing an interpretation of being and making sense of oneself. Doesn't Mike, Mike, doesn't Mike paradox, paradoxical question disrupt Cooper and our horizons of understanding? Doesn't it shatter our temporality? It might offer us a different possibility of time experience. My questions appear appearing in the first episode twice, and again after Cooper saves Palmer in episode 18. We might be able to say that in the first time we were in a future that came after Twin Peaks, but what about the second time, the second and the last time, when we see the question repeated after Cooper has already met Palmer and already saved her? Therefore, an apourier. In episode 17, Cooper is transmitted to the past of Firewalk with me. The original scene was in color and shot on film, but the return scene has been digitally desaturated to mark the differences. The past of Firewalk with me and the present of the return. In this manner, there's a manifestation of the material differences between the early version film and the latter digital images. Cooper is brought back in time for two scenes, in the first time to witness Nora weeping and screaming unexpectedly. The return has a reverse shot over there, planting Cooper in the trees and providing an explanation for her horror as a ghost from the future. In the second scene, Cooper meets her in the forest, prevent, preventing the murder. The first time, Cooper is an observer of history, but in the second one, is an active agent who can change it thanks to the dig digital image. The scene is colorized back to life, which marks the return of the present and the changing of history. It cuts to Nora's corpse being discovered in the first episode of Twin Peaks, and using an eraser digital effect, it deletes the corpse, hence changing history and tangling the two events together, her death and her life, while at the same time creating a triple bind of the three versions in the return. By changing, by changing its inciting incident, the return creates an effective transformation, placing Twin Peaks as an, un, as, as an authorized source under question. In this sense, it's not a relationship of progression, sorry, in this sense, it's not a relationship of progression, but of correction between their versions. The paradox of Nora being both dead and alive functions as Derrida concepts the gift in his 92, The Gift of Death, beyond economic relationships as an inaccessible secret, a great mystery. The digi digital image allows both events to stand together while sustaining the blurriness of their relationship. The return to the past creates a disguise for what Derrida called in the Spectres of Marx, a spectre or anthology, referring to the ha act active haunting of the present by the past heterogeneous forms, events, and ideas, enabling both events to exist simultaneously. This event, this way, Twin Peaks knowledge is haunting the return and do not, and do not proceed with it. But does it solve our points of the upper year? regarding the life or death of Nora Palmer, and what about the apory of time, of future or past? Move on. Uh, the loose crystal image might inform the possible answer. In the time image, the loose writes that what constitutes the crystal image is the most fundamental function of the operation of time. 
The crystal simultaneously contains on the pre present, which passes on, preserves on the heterogeneous past, and is launched towards the future, which is not there yet, in a dynamic process of non-chronologic distinction and difference. I quote from page 81, we see in the crystal, the perpetual foundation of time, a distinction in the process of being produced, the point of indiscriminability. Sorry to interrupt, two last two minutes left. Yeah, I'm just, yep. Of the two distinct images, the actual and the virtual, the very distinction between the two images, which keeps on reconstituting itself, and of course. The disagreeability point of the two states, the tangent with one another, the virtual, which has the force to exist, and the actual, which is the state of existing things, is analogic to Mora's core, to, to Mora's apurie, I am dead, yet I live, and to the apurie of time, through the crystal. Through the crystal, we can see that what was once a virtual, inaccessible past, Mora being dead, contains a potential seed of creating a different singularity, forming Cooper's returns to the past and changing history. Therefore, the virtuality existed in Twin Peaks universe and the golden seed of Mora inserted by the fireman creates the actuality of the return. In this way, her promise to Cooper from Twin Peaks last episode, I'll see you again in 25 years and the returns first, I am dead, yet I live, is being fully fulfilled. Thus, Mora is both dead and alive. She is alive because the return as a crystal image contains a heterogeneous past, including that of Twin Peaks where she was murdered and manifest its present through the crystal, which contains the, un the universe change following Cooper's transformative act. The crystal might enable to explain the other points of the apoye. Cooper's question, what year is this? Analogs mics, is it future or is it past? Time both as a mutual reflection image that answer to the crystal time regime. In both scenes, Nora screams unexpected unexpectedly as her scream develops from virtuality to actuality. The first time in the waiting room before the scream, she whispers in Cooper's ear, can you move on please? Mirroring the scene from episode eight and another one. Uh, mirroring the scene from episode nine of season one in Twin Peaks, where Cooper and the viewers eventually learned who killed her. In the return, the second map remains hidden. It functions as a Derridean gift, opening an abyss for understanding the narrative while tangling the scenes together. The second time, in the closing scene of the return, her scream ruptures the diegesis. Before it, she and the viewers heard her mother, Sarah, Pal Sarah Palmer, played by Grace Sabrisky, wailing from the episode, opening episode of Twin Peaks, calling in vain for more corpse has already been discovered. Following the entanglement of the versions, and although Mora is being seen as alive, the heterogeneous past of the universe haunts her as a spectre through the, through the crystal. Time makes itself visible through Mora as a production of crystal image, as a point of indiscriminability of her two states, producing the two events together. Just a sec, I'm wrapping up. Mora being dead and alive. The mirror is complete when after the frame closes, we see Mora whispering to Cooper in monochromatic colors and superimposed on the credits. They're happening at once, at the same time, and do not proceed with one another or create temporal horizons, but are crystalline states appearing at once. Thus, the, to the returns, Apurier, we can possibly say, answer, we are in the presence of crystal time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Your presentation was about uh, return of twin peaks, twin peaks through the crystal, estab establishment of crystal images, uh, the return as disguise variation for uh, deluge. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all, all the uh, panelists. And if anybody have any question in the audience, okay. Do you have any question? Hi there. I have a question for Lior. First of all, welcome to the Turkey. Uh, it's, it's great to see you here, actually. Uh, my question is about the film or the series Twin Peaks. Uh, what do you want to say about the ambiguous and uncanny atmosphere created by means of crystal images in Twin Peaks? And do you think that these images, I mean these crystal images buried in Twin Peaks, make the series incomprehensible, I mean not very understandable, or more meaningful and creates an extra era to think in a critical way? This is the question, actually. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the question. I didn't hear the first part, so I'm just gonna try to answer for the, uh, the second part. Um, 
when you say it's in in a comprehensible, you're talking on a certain uh, narrative logic, I presume, which I'm pretty sure. You're right. Which I'm pretty sure that David Lynch don't want us to think in that way. Well, I don't want to put anything in his way of thinking or like that. But it it allows us to find things in there, I guess. As as this, as I said, as Laura Palmer being both dead or alive, it defies our way of logical thinking. I'm I'm, I'm pretty nervous. I'm, I don't know if I'm answering it. Your question, but is is there any question? I think so. There is no question. Thank you so much for all the presentations. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Ori. And thank you. Thank you so much.